So we saw that uh, uh, in Hindustani music we speak of uh, seven Shuddhaswaras and um, five uh, uh, Vikrataswaras and then we have 22 Shrutis. The seven Swaras we know are Sari Gama Padhani, uh, but these actually are the shortened abbreviations of the actual names of the Swaras. These Swaras have names the seven swaras I mean. So, sa is shadja, ri is rishabha, ga is gandhara, ma is madhyama, pa is panchama, dha is dhaivata, ni is nishada. So, these are names and uh, uh, these names have been are, are found in ancient treatises like Naradiya Siksha which is uh, an early treatise that that is concerned with the phonetics of chanting of the Vedic hymns. So, Naradiya Shiksha um, here even in this treatise we have the these names, names of these uh, swaras and uh, there are some interesting aspects, interesting associations of these swaras. So, sa is supposed to be the associated with the cry of the peacock. Rishabha, the ri is, as some of you would know, Rishabha means the bull. Gandhara is the goat, that is the cry of the goat. Padhyama is the heron. Panchama is the cuckoo bird. Devata is the horse. Nishada is the elephant. Now, these, this is, these are well known associations and as intriguing and enchanting as they are, uh, not really clear what these associations mean. Uh, one thing you can definitely see is that Sa, Ma and Pa which are really the uh, tonal centers, so to say, uh, of it for us. Uh, they are associated with birds and the others are associated with animals. And, you know, uh, they, you might uh, think of this as just something fanciful or something that is poetic. Um, you see, uh, not only animals and birds, you, the notes, the swaras are also associated with colors, they are associated with rasa. So, each each uh, swara is associated with one color and one rasa or emotion um, and uh, also a deity. So, um, what we can uh, really gather from this kind of engagement with the idea of swara is that, you know, swaras are not aloof. They are not something that have nothing to do with the rest of human experience. They are very much part of uh, man in nature. Now, how, how is swara uh, defined in the uh, textual tradition? That's also, uh, it can be interesting to take a look at it. Now, how would you uh, define a swara. There is any swara. What is swara? How would you define it? Now, if you look at um, Wikipedia, it says that a musical tone is a steady periodic sound. Now, that this is obviously uh, cast in terms of physics, right? Periodic sound and all that. Um, but uh, suppose you were not to draw from the the physics of sound, but simply based on your experience of music, of swaras, how would you define swara? In the sense, swara is sound, right? It is dhwani. But so is my speaking and so is this. That's also dhwani. So how would you, if you had to, uh, how would you define 
സ്വരം ഓർമ്മോട്ട് വൺ ഓഫ് ദി വെൽ നോൺ വെരി വെൽ നോൺ ഡെഫിനേഷൻസ് ഡെഫിനേഷൻസ് യു കെൻ സി ഓഫ് സ്വര ഇസ് സ്വമേവ രാജത്തെ ദറ്റ് ഈസ് ഇറ്റ് ഈസ് ദാറ്റ് വിച്ച് ദിസ് ഇസ് ഓഫ് കോഴ്സ് സാൻസ്ക്രിറ്റ് സ്വമേവ രാജത്തെ ഇറ്റ് ഷൈൻസ് ഓൺ ഇറ്റ്സ് ഓൺ that is it is attractive it is attractive in itself some other things some other kinds of sound might be attractive you know but this is a classic uh, sanskrit example putraste putraste jata your son is born to you now that is sound and it is very pleasing right but it's not because of the sound itself it's because of what it means that is swara swameva rajate it it is uh, pleasing it, it it attracts on its own now see actually the context of this is uh, it it's more complex because it draws from the uh, the swara also means vowel you know swara in vyanjana swara means uh, vowel and there uh, this is a definition of vowel it's swameva rajate that is uh, a vowel is independent right you can say a e u without the help of a consonant whereas a consonant you can't pronounce a consonant without a vowel so in that context swameva rajate it shines on its own it it is expressed on its own that makes sense but then it is this the same definition is applied to swara as a musical uh, entity and um we have to uh, try and figure out what it means you know in this context but swasame rajate is is uh, is found in the 8th century text brihaddeshi and is one of the uh, most well known definitions if you want to call it that uh, definitions of swara uh, a more elaborate uh, definition by the 10th century brilliant mind um abhinav gupta he he includes other features such as anuranana that is resonance um snigdha snigdha is smooth shiny and madhura so this is um this is what abhinav gupta says and this is just for um those of you who have an interest in uh sanskrit uh, the verse goes like this vayam tu ശ്രുതിസ്ഥാനാഭിഘാത പ്രഭവശബ്ദ പ്രഭാവിതോ അനുരണനാത്മാ സ്നിഗ്ധമധുരശബ്ദ ഏവ സ്വര ഇതി വക്ഷ്യാമ സോ ഇറ്റ് ഇസ് അനുരണനാത്മാ ഇറ്റ് ഇസ് റെസുനൻറ്റ് ഇറ്റ് ഇസ് സ്നിഗ്ധ മധുര ഇറ്റ് ഷൈനി സ്മൂത്ത് ആൻഡ് സ്വീറ്റ് ആൻഡ് ദാറ്റ് ഇസ് സ്വര അക്കോർഡിംഗ് ടു അഭിനവ് ഗുപ്ത ആൻഡ് ഹൗ അബൌട്ട് ശ്രുതി വാട്ട് ഇസ് ഹൗ ഇസ് ശ്രുതി ഡിഫൈൻഡ് ശ്രുതി ഇസ് ഡിഫൈൻഡ് വെരി സിംപ്ലി അഗൈൻ too simply one would say shuyate iti shruti it is that which is heard is shruti now this again is uh, a lot of things are heard but you don't call them all shruti but again um this is again it goes back to the context of the vedas because the vedas are supposed to have been heard by the rishis by the sages um so that so they are heard therefore they are shruti so another word for veda is uh, shruti and um, in the context of music in the context of microtones when you say again that shuyate iti shruti what does that mean if we go back to the the observation made in the last video that uh, in the tradition shruti is sometimes regarded uh, by by some uh, theoreticians it's regarded as microtones as pitches themselves and by others it is regarded as intervals between uh, very close pitches the least discernible interval so i would say that when you say shruyate iti shruti uh, the shruti as a as a the least discernible interval 
make sense. That you can hear, you can discern that difference, that pitch interval. So, uh, if Shruti is taken in that sense, then this definition of Shruyate de Shruti uh, makes sense. So, now while we, you know, as I said, we acknowledge, we know that there are, uh, in physics tells us that there are infinite pitches between any two adjacent swaras. We can't discern all of them. We can discern a few. So, the, the discern, the hearability, the fact that you are able to hear that microtone, that that pitch is, you know, infinitesimally different from the previous one, that is itself its defining feature, shruyate iti shruti, that which is heard is shruti. Because what is, uh, what is heard in performance is swara, right? It, that whatever is heard in, uh, in performance attains the status, status of swara. We do not say we are singing uh, this shruti or that shruti. We are singing gandhara or, or we are singing ga or ma or pa in a particular shruti of it definitely. But we, we speak of swaras in the context of performance. Shruti is the matrix as it were of uh, possible pitches from which some are lit up as swaras. In fact, there is this um, thing that uh, the swara, the ra means rajra, Deepta, the, the expression deepta is used even today by many musicians when we say, when they say ki wo swara deepta man hai, that, that note is lit up, that particular pitch is lit up. So, uh, in that sense, um, what is the exact uh, way of shrutis or how exactly uh, can you grasp Shruti or even uh, perform them? That is a very um, intricate and uh, it, it is something that is learnt in, in practice through um, constant exposure and practice and training. So there is this uh, lovely verse in the Naradiya Siksha about the elusiveness of Shruti. It says, again it is a Sanskrit verse, Yathapsu charatam margo meenanam na upalabhyate akasheva vihanganam tadvat swaragata shruti. That is, just as you cannot really, uh, uh, you cannot really capture the, the path of a fish in water or a path of the, the path of a bird in flight in the sky, you can't really trace its way. You can't trace the path. So also you can't trace the path of Shruti. Um, now in uh, in practice, as I said, we there are some ragas uh, where we explicitly speak of uh, Shruti nuances. So for instance, uh, Rag Shri or Rag Marva, they have a Komal Rishab, Komal Ri, but it is higher than the, the normal uh, Ri. Now how do we actually hit that pitch that is higher than the normal Ri? That is where training comes in. That is where your, uh, what is called Talim comes in and the kind of exposure to good music that you've had and that's that's the only way you can capture those shrutis you see shrutis uh, confer a fluidity to swara the concept the idea of swara and the music itself so that though we may describe a raga in terms of its swaras as we often do the actual position of that swara is determined and propagated in practice. So, even within the same raga, the same note, same swara, so to say, might have slightly different uh, pitch positioning depending on the phrase. 
So this is this is something that, for instance, cannot be captured on an instrument like the harmonium or the keyboard, where you have very fixed keys um, and there is no continuity. But that is the life of uh, that's a very life breath of um, Indian music. The shrutis are a nebulous stratum, a matrix of possibilities, parts of which get lit up during raga presentation. Uh, in an evocative metaphor, uh, swaras have been compared to ghats in a river. Ghat is uh, ghats are steps leading uh, down from the banks to the actual waters of the river. Now, the the steps, the ghats are the swaras, and uh, the music is the stream of the river. That is, that is lapping against these uh, steps as it goes. Now, obviously, the waters don't, uh, you know, hit the steps at exact precise positions, right? They just flow over them, and sometimes a particular step it goes over. It. Sometimes it may go just a little below that step, or sometimes it may go between that step and another step, and so on. So that is, swaras are like those steps. Uh, and when we perform a raga, that is how we negotiate the swaras. I'll just end with uh, a bit of uh, rag shri. <laughs> Hey, hey, hey. 